What is going on, everyone? This is Miles with Windows Central Gaming, and welcome to the 34th episode of Xbox Chatterdays. I'm stoked about today's show. We have a ton of great topics, and I am joined by Windows, Windows Central's, Windows, God, I'm flubbing, Windows Central's Halo expert, Brendan Lowry, to talk about our impressions of Halo Infinite. We're going to be talking about Xbox being stronger than ever. We're going to be talking about a potential acquisition from Xbox and so much more. But before we dive into all of that, Brendan, how are you doing on this fine Saturday, my man? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, how, how, how's everybody else doing? You guys liking Halo? Oh, I'm curious to see what the uh, the audience's uh, opinion is because I've been having a lot of fun with the game. Uh, I think so far it's been like the most fun I've had in Halo since uh, MCC had a really big push like several months ago. It's been a really good time. Halo's back, baby. It's been so good to see all of the energy and excitement on social media. People who have been historically kind of negative or indifferent on Halo. I've seen some positive takes from them. So yeah, Halo's in a really good position and I'm excited to uh, get into some Halo Infinite impressions. Uh, some housekeeping as well. If you didn't check it out, uh, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Jason Ronald last week to talk about FPS boost, backwards compatibility, and all the all the work that that team puts in to enhance these games and let us play them better than ever before on our Xbox Series X and S. So if you haven't checked that out and you're interested in the, the nitty gritty details on backwards compatibility and FPS boost, especially for Dark Souls 3. Learning about what went into that gave me a much greater appreciation for FPS boost as a technology because it uh, sounds like it's not as simple as just un uncapping the frame rate and um, getting that 60 FPS. They put a lot of work into that, so it was really cool to get those insights. But before we dive into our impressions of Halo Infinite, I wanted to talk about the current state of Xbox because we got some earnings reports from Xbox this week and we got some exciting details about you know where Xbox stands, at least financially. And on paper right now, Xbox is bigger than they've ever been before. They are in the in the process in the midst of their biggest year ever financially. Um, they had a 172% boost in hardware, boosted by the Xbox Series X and S, obviously. Um, gaming revenue for the company was up 3.7 billion. Um, and they basically confirmed that the Xbox Series X and S are the, the best-selling Xboxes ever at this point in time, outselling the Xbox One, which came out of the gate with strong sales, but as we saw throughout the generation, lost a lot of momentum. So, Brendan, what I want to ask you and what I want to ask basically everyone hanging out in the chat with us today is why do you think there is so much positive momentum behind Xbox right now? I think the biggest reason why is because I think Game Pass has just grown to become such a valuable service. There's so much content and value within any of the Game Pass purchases, really. Uh, I mean, I myself, I'm on Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, and there's just so much in, in that package that's absolutely worth the $15 a month that it costs. Like, aside from just the games alone, I feel like it's worth it already. But then the fact that, like, there's also a huge library of games they've built up on PC as well, which is really cool, because, like, when the Xbox Game Pass Ultimate first started, there was only, like, 20 games. But now there's, like hundreds like it's crazy how much that has grown in such a short time and then also game uh xbox uh game streaming or however they're calling it cloud gaming uh that has come out of the gate surprisingly strong i think like it's especially since they recently upgraded their server blades with uh series x hardware and that like i don't really use that myself right now because i'm not exactly out much these days uh, but like for people who travel a lot, I've heard just from speaking to them personally that the ability to just stream a game to their phone is just huge. And especially when you have things like the Razer Kishi and stuff that like support that kind of gameplay style. Uh, I think cloud gaming is really starting to prove itself, really. Like I think Xbox is just kind of hitting all the fronts perfectly right now. Yeah, I think you put it excellently. Xbox is going to where the, the players are realistically. Obviously the console is still a big component 
of the the ecosystem and they wanted to make sure with with the xbox series x that they had you know the most powerful console that was on the market and with the xbox series s they wanted to have the most affordable basically appealing to anyone regardless of you know what your preference is obviously with the series x people want the performance um but they also want that convenience because obviously if you want the best performance you would invest in a a a dedicated gaming pc to get to get that experience but the Xbox Series X serves as this great middle ground where you get premium performance, legitimately premium, like Flight Simulator, for example, is running at ultra settings of PC at 14, 1440p, which is really impressive because I installed Flight Sim on my PC and played it. I have a 20 uh, RTX 2070 and it was struggling. It, it was struggling to maintain 30 FPS even. So seeing this running on the Series X for me is really impressive. Um, and like you mentioned, the Xbox Game Pass is, you know, without hyperbole, the best deal in gaming. It's like when Netflix first came out and you have all these all these people on the streets just talking about how the value of Netflix is ridiculous. You get all these movies and you can stream them and there's there's nothing, there's no catch to it. You just, you get all these movies, you can stream them and it's one low monthly price. So there's a lot of just organic word of mouth because of that. Like, like you and me who've been using Xbox Game Pass, we see that that value. And it's it's so hard to imagine a world for me where I don't have Game Pass now. Um, and just yeah. having that consistent stream of games coming in. So I think more and more people are experiencing Game Pass, seeing the benefit of having Game Pass and saying, you know what? Maybe I need to invest more in the Xbox ecosystem. I've had a PlayStation historically. I've had a PC historically, whatever it might be. But the convenience and the value of the Xbox platform right now is it's it's a hard deal to ignore. Yeah, and I think talking about investing into the Xbox ecosystem, I think I think the fact that Game Pass gives people such an easy way to do that is such a big deal because previously, if you wanted to invest in a a different ecosystem, you'd have to say, I want to buy a brand new console. And not mm-hmm. everybody right now has 300 to $500 to spend on a console, especially with what's been going on in the last year. But, uh, you know, $15 a month, that's a much, or 10 to $15 a month, or even sometimes $1 a month, depending on how, you know, if it goes on sale. Um, but that's, that's a much more reasonable ask. And if you've already got, like, a competent PC, for instance, you basically have... Uh, your own system already that you can add Xbox games to. Um, and yeah, I really like that they're... I like that Xbox has been leaning into uh, the Windows side of things a lot. Because I'm somebody who has been traditionally a PC gamer uh, through and through, and Xbox has kind of been like a side thing. Mm-hmm. But that that library is now on my PC, essentially. And I think that's really neat. Yeah, they they are letting you play the games that you own wherever you are, which is really, really important in this day and age because I've talked about this on previous episodes. Convenience is more important than anything else for the average person. Obviously, people like yourself want that, you know, premium PC experience and they're going to pay for it. But the majority of of players in this day and age are going to go where it's most convenient. So if if you're Xbox, you're looking at that and you're saying, okay, if you want to play on PC, you're not going to have to buy the game again on PC. You want to stream this game, you just open up the Game Pass app, you can stream it from your phone. Um, They are doing an amazing job of really catering to wherever you feel like playing. And it's opened up some possibilities for me that I probably wouldn't have explored if it was a a separate like service that i had to pay for and invest in like the cloud streaming for example with that being bundled into game pass ultimate if that was a separate thing i don't know that i would really invest that much time or energy into it but the fact that i can just open up an app on my phone uh, sync up a controller to my phone or my tablet and just stream games is is really cool and like you mentioned the upgrades that they've done to the server blades have been huge I played X Cloud when it was in beta um, over a year ago, playing stuff like Gears of War, and it it was solid, it was good enough, but you could feel that delay. You could feel the latency in a way that made me say, I can't play Gears of War 5 on this. Like, I know how Gears of War 5 should feel, and this feels different. Yeah. Re- revisiting it in the last month has been a night and day difference. There's still, if you had a side-by-side, like a dedicated a native rig and the cloud you would probably notice a difference but outside of that it is almost unnoticeable and that's kind of the 
the, the, the future and the dream of cloud streaming is that you're not losing that performance in a way that is, you know, impactful to the game. And we're getting there and it feels really, really good. So I got to give a quick shout out to the 111 folks rocking with us. Appreciate you guys tuning in. If you're new to the show, we're live every Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. If you're digging the show, hit that like button, share it out, and let's get this party jumping. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, the console sales right now, because with the Series X and S, you know, ahead of the launch of this, of these consoles, um, there was the conversations against critics and, you know, fairly so in, so in some cases where people are saying, why do I, why do I need an Xbox console? And as we're seeing with the sales, even with stock shortages, um, these consoles are selling better than any Xbox previously. So I want to know, you know, kind of what your thoughts were going into this release. Were you in the camp that Xbox, you know, I don't need a dedicated Xbox console as someone who, you know, plays primarily on PC. And I want to know what your thoughts were going into that. And then why you think the, the hardware itself, with that being kind of on the back burner compared to all the services, is doing so well right now. Uh, personally, I would say that I was in the camp of, I want one because it's new and shiny and cool, but uh -huh. I don't need, I don't need it right now because I have a 3070 PC, um, an RTX 3070 gaming PC with a, you know, a pretty recent i7 processor and a lot of RAM. So it was like, you know, this PC is going to last me through anything I'm playing for the next several years easily. But that being said, um, that also costs a lot of money and mm -hmm. uh like especially with the silicon shortages of the last year or so building your own pc has become a nightmare uh to the point where i would recommend anybody that wants to get a pc these days should just buy pre-built because doing it yourself is just unreasonably expensive with scalping so i think and that kind of leads into the Xbox consoles. I think what makes them so popular right now is you're getting so much performance for a very reasonable price. It truly feels like a next-gen system for even $300. Like, I mean, we were talking about Microsoft Flight Simulator. Uh, the fact that that game runs so well on Series S is kind of mind-blowing. Um, and it looks excellent. So... You know, I think the 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 sheer value of those consoles is probably what's driving their sales so hard. Is because people are realizing that, like, wow, for you know, three hundred to five hundred dollars, I'm essentially getting a you know extremely powerful gaming machine. Yeah, you. Yeah, those are excellent points. Like, we have I have the Series X in my office, and that's my main rig. But we hooked up the Series S in the living room recently, and I've been genuinely impressed by the performance on that like you said seeing i installed um flight sim on just to boot it up and see what it looked like and compare that to the the series x and it's it's impressive it's genuinely impressive to see flight sim because we know the the jokes when flight sim came out were this is the new crisis this is the new benchmark for your pc uh you had the memes of people talking about how their pc literally sounded like a jet engine when they're trying to run flight simulator so it's a technical marvel and it cannot be understated how impressive it is that Flight Simulator is running on the Series S at all in any capacity. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really amazing to see it run and run well and look really great. And then, you know, like watching my wife, who is, you know, inexplic inexplicably obsessed with State of Decay 2. Um, like she doesn't play a ton of games, but she loves State of Decay 2 and has just been going so hard on it. Like walking out into the living room as someone who's used to seeing her play that on the Xbox One X and then seeing it on the Series S, it's, you know, again, if we had a side-by-side -side with the Series X, I could probably notice a difference, but just walking by and seeing it, that looks like it's running on the Series X. It looks like it's running on this next-gen machine. It's 300 bucks. So I think a big reason it's doing so well is you can go to the store, you can pay 300 bucks for the machine, and then you can pay 10 to $15 for Game Pass, and you're essentially getting a next-gen console and hundreds of games for un after tax like 350 ish dollars in the u.s and that is a hard value to ignore especially when you compare that to you know the ps5 even the nintendo switch which for a long time had the the value crown at 300 bucks you know you're getting 
you're buying a Switch, you're buying one game. Let's say you buy a Switch, you buy Breath of the Wild. Absolute masterpiece. Everyone buys Breath of the Wild when they buy a Switch. That, after tax, is $400. And you're getting a Nintendo Switch, which is definitely a less powerful machine. And you're getting one game for more than it costs you to buy an Xbox Series S and get Game Pass. So exactly. they are doing some exciting things. And it's been really cool to kind of see this position in the industry where all three players are doing really, really well. Uh, PlayStation's breaking records. Nintendo inexplicably is just selling nonstop. The Switch will not stop selling and I cannot wrap my mind around it. Like every time I think like, okay, maybe the Switch is going to slow down. No, the Switch is still outpacing the Series X and and PS5 and Series S and it's, it's just absolutely wild. Yeah, I think, I think touching on the Xbox again, I think you know, as we were talking about, convenience is what people care about. And I think the fact that the Series S and the Series X have been built to be as convenient as possible is another big reason why they sell really well. Mm-hmm. I mean, you think about everything from, like, the UI of the consoles is basically an evolved version of what the Xbox One had. So people are, people are going towards something that's familiar and that they know if they were part of Xbox last gen. And I think that's valuable. Um also game pass itself is incredibly convenient and easy to do uh you know ten dollars boom you have 300 games at your right at your hands um and i i really do think things like that contribute to you know people choosing an xbox console over perhaps a playstation or a switch is you know on a switch or a playstation every game every new game is 60 to 70 dollars and it's like you know the, though that system has its merits, but I think people who are looking to enjoy a lot of games for a very affordable price, that's a huge value win. And the fact that it's also just so easy to just get in on that, I think that makes it very attractive. Yeah, it's it's really cool to be in a position where Xbox is is doing so well and you're seeing it on on social media. They're they're winning people over who've historically been, you know, PlayStation loyalists, Nintendo loyalists who've, you know, I know again, fairly so for some have written the Xbox platform off because as someone who's, you know, been a, a, a relatively diehard Xbox fan, the Xbox One generation, we didn't see Microsoft or Xbox firing on all cylinders in in many areas. And, you know, the criticisms of the Xbox platform, their games, their services, the power of the machine, um, it was hard to argue any of those. So um, there were people who, who looked at what Xbox had to offer in terms of games, in terms of the platform, and said, I don't need that. I can have my PlayStation, I can have my Nintendo, and I'm set. Um, now we're in a position where if you're someone who really does love gaming and wants to play great games, um, you can't really write off Xbox anymore. And that's, that's really exciting. If you're, you know, someone who's been a, an Xbox loyalist for all these years, you're seeing historically big, you know, PlayStation diehards talking about how the new Halo is looking great. The new Halo feels amazing. Xbox Game Pass is killing it. I love my Series X. I'm playing a lot of my games on Series X and that is amazing to see. And I think that all of those factors are kind of building in and and we're seeing it demonstrated in their sales and their success. Um, Couple that in with the fact that their marketing team has been on fire, absolutely killing it and making the Xbox brand and platform legitimately fun. (sighs) Xbox is doing all the right things right now and it's. It's interesting to me to see if they're going to be able to maintain that momentum because I feel like outside of some fumblings with maybe first party games and that's that's due to the pandemic so I don't really even want to you know fault them too heavily on that outside of those kind of uncontrollable factors with game development and the delays their messaging and their cadence and their delivery on everything so far since the launch of the Xbox Series X and S has been borderline perfect I honestly I can't personally think of a time where a gaming company was this consistently, you know, successful with these marketing pushes and successful with this messaging. Um, What about you? Do you think Xbox right now as it stands is doing better than PlayStation and Nintendo when it comes to marketing their platform? I think so, yeah. Uh, I think uh, overall, it seems that everywhere you look, no matter what you're looking for, Microsoft has a convenient and user-friendly answer for you and i think that's a big deal um because nintendo and sony frankly don't have that like i mean i know 
Nintendo, I think the biggest issue with the Switch for me is Nintendo's really strange lack of uh, acknowledgement of like uh, Joy-Con drift issues and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it's it's crazy that people have been talking about that for like three, four years, and Nintendo has been relatively radio silent about that. And that, like to me, that shows like I don't, I'm not confident in my Nintendo hardware when that's a problem. Uh, and you know we're gonna get into the Sony SSD thing later in the show. Yeah, but absolutely, I think the way Sony has handled that has been a bit confusing in ways that it didn't need to be. Um, we'll we'll get into that soon, but yeah, I I think both hardware and software, and again like PlayStation Now too, I think that service could be expanded to be a lot better than it currently is because right now it's only on your PS4 and your PS5, which is you know it's fine. But when you consider that Game Pass and cloud gaming is working on any device that you own, essentially, it kind of makes me look at PlayStation now and say, like, why isn't Sony trying to compete with Xbox on this? Um, so I think overall, I think Xbox is really leading the way in, in, in being innovative and, uh, you know, breaking new ground, I guess. Yeah, I you know, it's, it's really exciting because let's be real, we obviously... We, a lot of us have our preferences, they have our our favorite platforms, whatever, but the reality is all three of PlayStation, Xbox, and Nintendo are doing exceptionally well. And the fact that Xbox is shining in a time where PlayStation and Nintendo are both doing really well is, is incredible, and that's incredibly impressive because, you know, we've had different generations where somebody's, f somebody's fumbled in a huge way. Uh, the Wii U, um, put... PlayStation had this opportunity where the Wii U and the Xbox One existed at the same time, and that gave them this huge spurt of growth because on paper, people could look at what PlayStation was doing and say, yo, PlayStation's killing it. They have great games. They have a great value for their console. The console is more powerful. I'm just going to buy a PlayStation 4. And they just took off with momentum because you had Xbox and Nintendo quite frankly and brutally honestly fumbling in huge ways and now we're in a position where all three are doing well and xbox is still shining and that is a huge testament to the commitment from microsoft uh, from phil spencer the leadership team the hardware team the software team the partnership team the game pass team all of these teams are working together in a way that i've you know i've never seen before from Xbox, and I've never really seen before from anyone in you know my my thirty years ish of gaming. I've never seen a company kind of come together in this synchronized way and really deliver on all fronts. And it's it's awesome. You know, you don't have to put down another platform to look at what somebody's doing and say they are doing it well and they are doing it right. And there's stuff to be excited about. So yeah, Xbox is killing it, and that is the reason they're bigger than ever. And I'm excited to see what the next few years look like for Xbox because if, if they maintain this momentum, I don't see, you know, in three years, three years from now, I don't see people just writing off Xbox. I don't see how you can write off Xbox in three yeah. years if they continue this pace. And I think it's exciting just purely as a gamer because, like, preferences and whatever aside and social media, you know, console war, like, I think everybody who's serious about gaming just wants to play fun games. Mm -hmm. And I think a position where all the big players are putting out fun games, uh, that's just that's a beautiful thing that the industry should strive for and that we should be happy about. I think this current generation is probably going to be one of the best ever. And I think the reason why is because every everybody in the game is uh, firing on all cylinders. Um. And it's exciting to think about the fact that, you know, everybody's going to have something fun to play. Yeah, it's it's overwhelming for me right now as someone who has a Switch, has a PS5, has a Series X, has a gaming PC. I look at all the amazing games that came out in the last like week and a half, and I literally have to sit down and like debate on which ones I'm going to play. Because at the end of the day, I don't have the time to play all of these great games. I want to. I wish I did, but I don't. So now... Already we're in a position where I have to pick and choose which amazing games I'm going to play. And that's that's an awesome place to be in. And I think, like you, you said, it's, it's beautiful to see all of these companies just going for it. And the more competition and the more that these companies are consistently doing well, the more that their competition is going to have to step up and say, damn, okay, Xbox is doing this. Or Xbox is looking at PlayStation and they're going to say, damn, PlayStation's doing this. How do we compete? 
And that is just going to, uh, for us as gamers, lead to better services, better value, and ideally better games. So I'm stoked. Yeah, um, yeah uh, I think the Steam Deck too is something that we should bring up because I'm actually really excited about the Steam Deck. Uh, I think it's a really fun idea to be able to bring your Steam library with you on the go, like a Switch. Mm -hmm. And I think that thing is going to drive some interesting uh, competition moving forward where it's like, you know, we have cloud gaming, we have a Steam Deck for mobile PC gaming, we have a Switch, uh, and, you know, PlayStation doesn't currently have anything. But I think with the push that mobile gaming is getting, or I guess you could say portable gaming, because I don't necessarily mean smartphone, yeah, you know, yeah. apps gaming, but I think that the push that portable gaming has seen recently and is going to get, uh, I would really like to see, like, the Vita return. Oh, yeah. And I would, like, I, I really, I think it's exciting to think about where that space is going. Uh, and maybe Xbox might develop their own. I think I think our, our, our own Daniel Rubino and Windows Central uh, called it the X-Boy. Which... <laughs> That's right. Yeah, the X-Boy. <laughs> I don't know if I like that name, but I like the concept. Uh, and I think it'd be fun to see uh, how portable gaming develops now that, uh, you know, the consoles are very satisfying and well done so that's kind of an exciting place i think the industry could go soon yeah i think you bring up an excellent point there i think we're definitely going to see a lot more like portable you know gaming options as we've seen with the switch people like it people want it it sells well and with with you know the steam deck coming out um that's going to open up some new possibilities for you know carrying your steam library with you anywhere being able to play amazing indies on the go being able to play these big they're, they're talking about, you know, AAA new titles being able to run on this thing. And I, I don't imagine Xbox hasn't been prototyping something. Um, I'm curious to see, you know, we've seen the Surface Duo, which has offered kind of a cool glimpse into what that could be with the, the foldable screen with the controls on the bottom. So you have this one contained unit. And I think that's the biggest thing. Or I guess my biggest criticism with mobile gaming in general and like xCloud is the fact that you have to have your phone, you have to have the controller clip and you have to have a controller. Like, I don't necessarily want to bring all of those things with me all the time, but if I had one device that it was all contained, like the Steam Deck, all contained, I just pull that thing out and I can play, that to me is more enticing. Um, despite the fact that I always have my phone on me. I'm not always going to have my, you know, controller clip and controller. Obviously they've been leveraging the, the touch controls and trying to make that more of a thing. Um, I just like that tactile response personally. I like the, the physicality of joysticks, controllers, buttons. Um, but I understand for some people, the touch controls are totally fine and it's, it's convenient. So, um, yeah. yes, I'm excited to see the future of portability in the space and let's go, let's will the X boy into existence. Phil, um, Jason Ronald hardware team from Xbox. If you're listening, uh, give the people what they want. Give us the dedicated X boy. Uh, I got to give a quick shout out to the 216 people rocking with us on this beautiful, blessed Saturday morning. Appreciate you all. Again, if you're new to the show, we're live every Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. If you're digging the show, hit the like button, share it out. I see amazing people in the chat. We got Yodani. We got Neil B. We got Busy Dad Gaming, Binyabik, Silver Fox. And speaking of Silver Fox, we have a super chat from Silver Fox here that says... How do we still not have a Halo Infinite Collector's Edition announced? Um, what do we want? Brendan, if Halo is announcing a, a ridiculous, a, a super baller Collector's Edition for Halo Infinite, what do you want as a, as a diehard Halo fan? Oh, that's tough. Uh, I think the, the obvious and safe answer is a, is a Master Chief helmet that I can wear. Not a, uh, not a cat sized one. No, um, man, probably a statue. But I believe that there were already pre orders from Best Buy that had a Master Chief statue in it. Um, what else do we want from a Halo Collector's Edition? Maybe like a Warthog, an RC Warthog. Is that what we're talking? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'd be down for that. Um, I'm trying to think of all the 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 franchises most. Uh, iconic you know vehicles characters weapons uh it's a tough one 
there's a, a lot of good ones there. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of possibilities, and um, I'm curious to see, you know, what other kind of Halo anniversary stuff we see around the holidays because we've seen teases from like Hyperkin. Like, there's been talks that maybe there's going to be another Duke, like a 20th anniversary Halo Duke controller, and stuff like that gets me excited as someone who's been playing since the OG who played Halo. Combat Evolved on the Duke, stuff like that is exciting, but for an official collector's edition, yeah, we've seen the helmet done with Halo 3, but it was a cat helmet, you couldn't wear it, so a, a full-size wearable Master Chief helmet would be pretty great. Um, uh, a plasma sword, a needler, something like that, like a full-scale replica, something like that would also be pretty sweet. They could throw in one of those, uh, I don't know if people in the chat have seen, but uh, Krispy Kreme in Mexico is making a Halo Infinite donut. Yes. What? So I got I to gotta rant about that real quick. How come Mexico and the UK get these awesome Xbox-themed donuts, and America, the good old USA, has no collaboration with Krispy Kreme? I know. What? Come on. That's a, that's a fumble by the marketing team. I've, I've you know, talked about them killing it. But right there, that is a missed opportunity. How do you how do you skip the American demographic with donuts? I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it goes together like bread and butter. I would have been, I would have rushed to a Krispy Kreme that same day and bought a dozen Xbox donuts. But no, that's that's on you, Microsoft. That is on you. All right, so we're going to talk about acquisitions, Brendan, because. That's people love it. It's acquisition season. Uh, it's been acquisition season for uh, about two years now. Um, but we're going to talk about some interesting details that have come out of this Xbox earnings report that people have pointed to some interesting similarities between a statement in this earnings report and a statement in, the, in an earnings report right before the big Bethesda Zenimax acquisition. So as part of the earnings report, there was a statement that said, we continue to invest in new gaming studios and content to expand our IP roadmap and leverage new content creators. So a lot of people have been speculating that that is an interesting sentiment considering almost this exact line was used in the earnings report before the Bethesda Zenimax acquisition. So I'm gonna put on a tinfoil hat. Uh, we're gonna go down the rabbit hole and we're going to talk about, you know, a, a acquisition on the level of Bethesda and ZeniMax. And one that has some interesting details that we can point to right now. And that is my favorite publisher, my favorite Xbox target publisher, and that is Capcom. I want to talk about Capcom because there's been a few things I've noticed this year that have not historically been the case when it comes to Xbox and Capcom. First off, Games with Gold. Everyone complains about Games with Gold. I get it. There's fair criticisms to be levied against what Games with Gold is offering. But, but, take a look at every month of Games with Gold this year. You will notice a very distinct and interesting pattern of Capcom titles. Different Capcom franchises being featured almost every single month this year. Now, I know it's not, it hasn't been every single month, but almost every single month this year with Games with Gold, there has been one Capcom title. And that's interesting. They're, they're spreading, they're getting, um, you know, all these different IP from Capcom in the hands of Xbox players. There's also been a in, incredible number of Capcom specific publisher sales this year. And I know Capcom publisher sales, that's not a new concept. That's not something that's never happened before, but I've never seen this many in one year. Um, again, and if you're trying to, you know, get the Xbox audience excited about that, you're trying to get these IP and these franchises in the hands of the players ahead of an acquisition like this. So Brendan, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on Xbox acquiring Capcom? Would that be a good move? And do you think this would be on the same level as a Bethesda and ZeniMax? Uh, you know, I think it's a good idea. I think what you saying capcom acquisition my mind immediately jumps to monster hunter it jumps to street fighter it jumps to resident evil uh all these franchises that capcom is behind that are really popular and uh are very different and interesting and i think would bring a lot of unique things to the xbox ecosystem like i know that uh xbox's fighting game 
prowess is kind of you know here or there a little bit yeah they need some um, they need some big fighting games for sure uh yeah and i think street fighter would would help that a lot uh i think monster hunter is a big one because i've actually been recently playing through monster hunter world for the for pretty much the first time i played it a while back didn't really stick with it uh i'm playing it again now with my friends and it's really clicking with me this time it's so good it's so good it's a it's a fun game it's a fun game uh I mean, it's just a blast to take on a big dinosaur and, you know, a big giant dragon bird shows up and it just becomes a chaotic hunting battle. But uh, <laughs> that game is a blast. Um, never have been really the biggest Resident Evil guy, but I understand why people do like it. Uh, and I, th I respect it as a franchise. Um, and I think that would be, like, massive, especially since I think Resident Evil Village was a huge hit for fans of the genre. Uh, the franchise, uh, it seemed like everybody loved Resident Evil Village. Yes, um, and, that's and my seven, game of the year right now. And Seven before it, too. I know Seven was also a huge hit. Um, so I think that's a pretty big one. And I don't know if I would say it's as big as Bethesda, but it's definitely huge. Yeah, when they talk about these these lines, like they're trying to expand our IP roadmap, um, things like that, you look at a Capcom and you, like you said, Monster Hunter, you have Resident Evil, you have Street Fighter, you have Devil May Cry, you have Mega Man, you have a stacked library of incredible IP. And, you know, if you're getting, obviously Capcom, unlike a Konami, has, a you know, dedicated in-house studios who can make these projects. And then you could leverage out, you know, partner studios to make some of the smaller scale stuff like a Mega Man. Um, there is huge potential for Capcom and Xbox Game Pass specifically. I think, you know, again, this is all just speculation, tinfoil hat time. But I think, again, and I've, and I've talked about this before, if I'm Xbox, if I'm Phil Spencer, and I'm, you know, dedicated to increasing my appeal in, you know, a Japanese market, I am calling Capcom every single day. I am talking to lawyers every single day, and I'm trying to figure out what that takes and if this is something that we can do. Again, there's no word right now that Capcom has any interest in selling. There's a bunch of complicated legalities involved that would make this really, really involved. And I just think for Xbox, if you're looking to get that big publisher that's going to move the needle for you in Japan and move the needle for you when it comes to taking market share from, you know, a PlayStation, who's a lot of these iconic franchises from Capcom have been associated with PlayStation. What well, even though they're not exclusive, like stuff like Resident Evil Monster Hunter, um, there's been this association with PlayStation. So you get that, you pull that in, you are pulling PlayStation people in, unquestionably. Um, so I think Capcom is the the pick. And people, you know, they have their their wild speculations and theories. But what I want to hear from you now is what is your wild publisher, your big publisher get that Xbox quote unquote needs to have? Put me on the spot. Yeah, um, I'm doing it. Oh. Uh, probably for me personally, probably Bungie. I'm a huge Destiny fan. Uh, huge on Destiny. I think that'd be huge if they could get Bungie. Um, plus, it'd be kind of funny considering, you know, the history of Halo. Um, but that's not probably going to happen because Bungie is uh, happy to have a third of its audience in PlayStation. Yeah, it's, but, it's, you know. it's been an interesting conversation that's been going on for a while, the, the Bungie rejoining the Xbox family. And, you know, now that Tencent's involved, there's probably some more you know, complicated stuff there. Xbox would likely have to buy out the stakes from Tencent as well. Um, so it would be interesting. If Bungie joins Xbox Game Studios, again, I'm going to put you on the spot here, what would you want them to do? Well, I think for me, as such a huge Destiny fan, I think what I would prefer is if a lot of the extra resources that afforded them could go into Destiny. Because I think Destiny... For those of you guys who don't know, Destiny used to be under Activision, and then about a year, like two years ago, Bungie kind of I think, I think a year or two ago, Bungie decided to basically leave yes. that partnership, mm -hmm. and they've been self-publishing since then, and it's it's brought a lot of good things for the game, I think, but it's also there have also been some rough things that have been added to the game, particularly I think the way that the microtransactions in Destiny Two work. 
mm. have kind of degraded because obviously Bungie doesn't have the resources from Activision that they used to, and I think you can really feel that in their pushes to get people to spend money on the game, you know, between expansions. So I think, honestly, if, if Bungie was under Xbox Game Studios, I think the smartest thing to do would be to uh, build that, not trust, but build that system back up to a more player-friendly uh, system. And not that Destiny isn't player-friendly right now. You can play pretty much everything in the game by just, you know, getting the game, getting the season pass, and buying the expansions, which is how any other MMO-type game works. Uh, but, you know, I think with how much cool stuff there is in their microtransaction store for, like, player expression, that's kind of hard, to, hard unavailable to people unless they want to spend money. I think improving that side of the game would be really good. Also, Bungie has a new IP that nobody knows anything about that's coming in the future. Uh, and I really hope that just being a part of that studio would uh, would help make sure that that IP succeeds. Yeah, um, I, st- I saw some folks in the in the chat talking about that new IP, and that's that's really interesting because Xbox is basically not not blatantly, but they've expressed that they want teams who can come out and deliver new IP that are successful. Because I think a big focus of Xbox Game Studios now is with the flexibility that Game Pass provides. They don't have to rely on sequels after sequels after sequels. They can push new IP in a way that, you know, we didn't really see or we haven't seen since, I don't know, maybe the PS1 generation. Back when a lot of these teams, smaller scale, were able to take risks and put out weird new IP. And I think that's going to be a huge focus for Xbox Game Studios. And when you talk about a Bungie working on a new IP, that that fits in well. We know Bungie can put out a new IP successfully. Uh, they, They did Halo. They did uh, Destiny. So we know that Bungie can come out and put out a new uh, IP that's successful. So again, if if you're Xbox and you're you're telling your audience this, you're telling the public that's what you're looking for. Maybe you are having conversations with with a Bungie. Yeah, and I mean, and it's clear that like the the relationship between the two is obviously good because, uh, you know, Destiny Two Beyond Light was kind of marketed as like the launch day playable experience for the Series X. Mm-hmm. I know that when that came out, the day it came out, Destiny 2 got upgraded to be uh, 60 FPS on series consoles and supporting 4K. Uh, and it was, you, you can get Beyond Light for free with Game Pass, and I'm pretty sure you can get the other expansions too. Um, so clearly that relationship is good. So it's not like the most out of the world thing ever. And even like I was saying, you know, like Bungie doesn't want to abandon their fans on PlayStation. They don't have to. I think that's something that's important to talk about is just because, you know, Bungie could theoretically be part of Xbox Game Studios does not mean that the game will cease to exist on a PlayStation. Maybe Xbox will have, you know, exclusive content and whatnot, but I'm pretty sure Phil even said that, like, you know, an Xbox Game Studios game doesn't have to be exclusive to Xbox. I'm pretty sure that conversation was cropping up when the Bethesda thing was still fresh. Yeah. Um, And obviously... We're expecting most Bethesda games to be exclusive, like Starfield, we know is going to be exclusive. But I think the fact that it doesn't have to be is something that people need to remember. So it is interesting to think about, like, what if what if Destiny was an Xbox Game Studios game? And what if Bungie was, you know, under Xbox? How would that look? And I think it could work. I mean, it's interesting just to think about it. Yeah, because, I mean, we look at um, Elder Scrolls Online as a prime example of that. Uh, These games that already exist and have an audience, um, Xbox and Phil Spencer specifically have said, we're not trying to take games away. That's that's not our objective by buying these teams. So I imagine a something like a Destiny 2 would still exist as this MMO that people could play on any platform. And I imagine they would just bundle the expansions into Xbox Game Pass to incentivize that you sign up for Game Pass, but they would probably still exist on your your PlayStation. They would exist on PC, but you would just have some incentives to kind of invest in the Xbox side of things. So let's let's transition into the, the meat, the meat and potatoes of this show and something that I am so stoked to talk about because I've been having a blast. I know you've been having a blast and I've seen so many people on Twitter absolutely loving Halo Infinite and this first flight. So we're going to talk about our overall impressions of Halo Infinite and the basically two maps and and bots that we've we've experienced so far. So Brendan, in broad strokes, 
How are you feeling about Halo Infinite multiplayer right now? So, right out of the gate, my the thing that impressed me the most is how snappy all the weapons feel. Like, it, they feel so good to shoot. And I think that's a really important part of what makes a Halo game good. Is, you know, Halo, Halo was always at its most successful when it was sandbox-driven. When the focus of the game was running around the map and finding cool new toys to use. And I think that they've really nailed that so far with this game. Like, every gun in that beta, or technical preview, is, like, a blast to use. I think my favorite currently is the, the VK-78 Commando. That thing's so cool. Uh, but, like, the battle rifle feels awesome. The uh, the assault rifle feels awesome. The sidekick feels amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's a couple I don't like. I think the needler feels a bit weird right now. Uh, but, like, the vast majority of them are awesome. The... Uh, the skewer is like such a cool gun. Um, I love the idea of this is gigantic shoulder mounted the thing that shoots a giant spike and just instant kills whatever you hit with it. Uh, all the weapons are just super fun to use. Um, I think another thing that really shocked me uh, was just how well the bots, like how, just how good the bots are. Like they're surprisingly competent in a way that games that have had bots for years are not. Like, even the marine bots that the, the technical preview started out with would throw these incredibly, like, crazy grenades that, like, would it'd be like what a player would throw. And it would just comp- it would catch me completely off guard. And the, the scary thing about the ODST bots now is that they, uh, they take the power weapons. And it, it freaks me out whenever, like, I see one of them walk up to the skewer and take uh-huh. it. It's like, oh, oh, God, the robot has the power weapon. <laughs> Uh, but and then the third thing I would say is I'm really loving the uh, the grappling hook. Um, that thing is so cool to use on the newest map they've released. Uh, I forget what it's called, but it has the grappling hook on it. And uh, that thing paired with the gravity hammer is a good time because you can you basically just you know you attach it to the wall next to a guy, fly towards him, swing the gravity hammer, free kill, and it just feels really good. And you can also, like, uh, you know, attach it to the ceiling and swing around like Tarzan and stuff. And it's just, like, it's powerful, but it's it feels pretty balanced, too. Where, you know, if you're caught in midair and people see you, like, they'll, they'll gun you down. So the, it seems like they've, the balance of it is really, you know, it seems very balanced so far. Obviously, it's hard to talk about balance until we're playing against each other and not bots. But the bots are doing an alarmingly good job of pretending to be players so oh all in all i just i really like what i what i've experienced so far i think it's all just really fun it it feels so great and that is the biggest thing about halo and why it has this huge following is the games have always felt really good so for me halo infinite sits in this middle ground between like classic halo combat evolved and Halo 5. So a lot of the mobility stuff from Halo 5 is gone. Your your shoulder check, your dash, your boosters, your ground pound, all that stuff is gone. It's a little more streamlined, so it's pretty much just sprinting and you have a, a slide for mobility. But I don't know if you noticed this, Brendan, but you can do a slide into a jump and you can just, you can haul ass around these maps if you just spam the slide into the jump you get so much mobility and momentum by doing a slide jump and stuff like that feels really good you combine you do a slide jump into the grapple shot hit the ceiling fly across the map like they are doing an excellent job of giving you ways to have additional mobility in these maps and oh like you said the bots the bots feel uncanny because you have you know a lot of a classic stereotypical player stuff implemented into these bots so spamming grenades the grenade throws yes the bots do that the 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 quintessential halo jump where people are just jumping constantly so you have to like shift your your aim they're doing that they're the odst bots do the quick duck where they duck for a second and then pop back up like there's so many quintessential like halo like pro player moves that these bots are doing and like you said it, it these bots feel really fleshed out in a really cool way and it's it's an amazing feature because historically people have had pretty harsh criticisms of games implementing bots i always think it helps to kind of keep the room filled so if somebody drops out you're not losing a player a player it's not shifting the tide of the battle too much and knowing that the bots in halo are this competent and like you said when they pick up a power weapon that horrifying it kind of you know alleviates a lot of my fears about the bots um 
the skewer yeah. my favorite weapon by far that thing is so mean so big so powerful hard to aim but if you do hit someone they're dead that is a guaranteed kill yeah. and it feels so good when you do um all of the weapons in this game outside of the needler i, I kind of have some complaints about the needler sound design but every other gun in this game sounds massive when you have the bulldog and you're in a hallway firing those shells the, they ricochet and the sound echoes for four or five seconds like everything sounds huge and oh i cannot give this team enough credit for the sound design of the game um yeah it's th fantastic there's been some audio bugs here and there but when everything works as intended oh my god God, dude, Halo Infinite is probably the best sounding shooter that I've ever played. Yeah. I also think, talk, talk, talking about the bots, I think, you know, aside from just being a room filler, which is valuable, I think what I really like about the bots is that we have sort of this system that is an onboarding process for new players and also a, a practice, a way for experienced people to practice. And I think that's really valuable because you think about Halo Infinite, it's free to play. It's going to be on Xbox and PC. Uh, it's going to be cross play, which is a big thing. Uh, all of those factors are going to lead to Halo Infinite easily, I'm guessing, being one of the most, you know, high player base count Halo games ever. And I think with how many new players that a free to play model is going to draw in, I think it's really valuable and important that the bots are as good as they are and that they have that academy training system in place because that is effectively going to help new players get in on the series that so many other people have learned and played for years and years and years. And I think it's really important that they uh, they accomplish that. Yeah, I think the shooting range is going to be huge for new players and even someone like me, like understanding these new weapons because historically when you're playing Halo multiplayer, you have to rush, you have to get the power weapon. And that's the only way you get to kind of you know, get familiar with it in multiplayer is rushing it and grabbing it. And it's, there's a lot of pressure when you pick up a new weapon for the first time, you don't know how it works. So you're trying to shoot someone, you die instantly. So you don't really get any practice with that gun because you've picked it up and you've died. So it takes so long to really understand how these guns would work under normal multiplayer circumstances. So it's really cool that you can go into the shooting range, you can adjust the difficulty of the bots and you can get you can get a really good feel for how this gun works. So when you go into a match, you get the skewer, you you know how it fires, you know how to lead your shots and stuff like that's going to be huge for new players and you know as they continue to add new weapons to the game because there's a decent slice of guns in this, but they've already told us that there are way more guns in the the, the final final version of this. Mhm. Mm yeah, I mean, everything about Halo Infinite so far has just been impressive, I think, is just the best word I can put out. Like, even the, you know, I think the first map kind of wasn't very visually interesting. I thought it kind of looked a bit weird. The second map, though, looks cool. Uh, the second map looks really sweet. Like, a lot of cool lighting and uh, textures on that map that, like, really sell the game. as like, yeah, this game's going to look awesome when it actually comes out, and I've, all of these, you know, graphics are finalized. Like, I think... Obviously, there's been a lot of doubt about how Halo Infinite will look because of that really underwhelming uh, initial gameplay reveal. Um, but I think that, like, the second map in the or in the technical preview has really sold me that, like, once things are finalized, this game's going to look awesome. I agree, yeah. Pretty much what we're showing in the stream here, if you're watching the video, this is this is all the first map. I didn't capture any footage from the second map yet, but yeah, the second map that they introduced looks so much better. Um, this one to me, it doesn't look bad. I think it looks good. As you can see in the video, like the lighting is great. The texture quality is really high. Like the game fundamentally looks good. So I didn't really have concerns after playing this map in terms of like how the game would look at launch. Um, but the second map looks incredible. You can look out this window and there's water droplets streaming down the, the glass and you can see this big kind of damn waterfall in the background. And there's all these little like subtle details in the stage that look amazing and show the, the the care and attention to detail that went to went into these stages because one of my biggest complaints of halo 5 is that all of that they leaned way too heavily into forge so a lot of the official multiplayer maps for halo 5 were made in forge and it looked like it there was like the kind of no character no soul or detail to these maps it was just you know a bunch of 
universal assets placed around a, a space, and that was the map. So for me, that was a huge complaint because I loved classic Halo maps and the care that went into them. So even just these first two, even just this taste, makes me way more confident in the actual map design in Halo Infinite compared to um, Halo 5. For sure. Uh, and, you know, I think, I think another big issue with Halo 5 was, I don't know if anybody remembers the beta, for Halo 5, but it looked so much better than the final game. Cause I the, do remember uh, that. Mm -hmm. The shadows were so much better, and the, the lighting was just so much better, and they sort of... People were complaining they couldn't see, which I always thought was kind of goofy, because I thought it looked fine, and then when the game came out, like all the lighting was really flat, and all the character models had no... They didn't respond to shadows, so Spartans were glowing in the dark, and it didn't look too good. I think Halo Infinite has struck a nice balance there because obviously you need high visibility in a competitive shooter but i also think with that outline system they have going instead of team colors i think you know regardless of how you feel about team colors i think that system kind of lets them uh help make the player models respond more to uh lighting and i think that makes the game look better too um and so far like the lighting on both maps is really really good um, cause that was my biggest issue with Halo 5 is the lighting was very flat and it was really hard even in Forge to make like a good looking map because of that. Yeah. But that, I yeah. think Halo Infinite is, uh, the lighting looks so much better. And, you know, I, I think as we've seen with like the, the, the initial gameplay preview of the campaign, uh, lighting can make such a difference because the lighting in that was very, uh, underwhelming. And it really made the gameplay look very flat and boring. Whereas, like, when they showed us that footage of the campaign uh, at E3, it looked gorgeous. And it was, it, you could tell that a huge season wow was because the lighting had been vastly improved. So I think the improved lighting of Halo Infinite compared to its initial 2020 debut is, I think, the biggest thing for me, graphically. Yeah, they made some huge strides in, in the graphical department compared to what we've seen. Obviously, we haven't got our hands on the, the campaign, the, the bigger, bolder scaled world and to see how, how that looks visually. Because, you know, objectively, it's, it's probably easier to take these confined, tight maps and make them look better, uh, make them have better lighting, be able to control the lighting more. But one thing they are talking about with the Halo Infinite campaign is they, they have this dynamic lighting where you're going to have a, a light source above you in the sky that moves and shifts, and that's going to affect the lighting of the world. Um, so that is something they've talked about with Halo Infinite campaign. Obviously, that's probably not something implemented into the multiplayer maps. They might be able to, you know, move them statically, but I don't imagine within the scope of a match, we're going to see the lighting shift that drastically. So, uh, yeah, as we've seen with these two maps, the lighting does look great. Textures look great. Um, it's not the most, like, mind-blowing game visually but i think overall it looks pretty incredible and it looks in my opinion better than halo 5 which a lot of people kind of uses this this example of like the quote-unquote best looking halo um so for me i'm excited um gotta yeah. give a quick shout out to the almost 300 people hanging with us on this fine saturday i see mr joanna dark in the chat i see paris lily in the chat um, thanks so much for hanging out, everyone. We're ha having a great time. If you're excited about Halo, hit that like button, share it out. Um, Brendan, do you have any criticisms of what we've experienced of the, the Halo multiplayer so far? Obviously, it's only bots. Obviously, it's only two maps. Is there anything standing out to you right now that is a, a concern for you as a Halo fan? I can't say there's anything that really concerns me greatly. I think my biggest complaint about the gameplay experience right now is that I think between the Spartan chatter system with all the, your teammates calling out things and your AI buddy who's calling out things and Jeff Steitzer who's calling out things, I think it's kind of it's a little bit overwhelming with all those voices. Spectacular. <laughs> exactly overkill i think it's a bit uh i think it gets a bit overwhelming but see the nice thing is you can turn spartan chatter off so that helps but i do think because i think the, the system is cool i think it's cool to hear your teammates say you know a helpful call out uh but i think they need to they need to uh rebalance how often uh your ai talks versus how often your spartan guys talk versus how often 
Jeff Steitzer's voice is heard to make that feel a bit less overwhelming. Yeah, I, I can understand that. I'm kind of in the opposite camp there. I, I love the the AI and the Spartan chatter. Um, this isn't something that is confirmed, but it's something that we assume. You're going to be able to customize your Spartan's voice. And one thing that I, I loved that I heard in this is that there are really distinct voices for Spartans. You have a dude with a, a thick Southern accent, and you have a bunch of other characters that have these obvious distinct voices. So if you're in a squad with, with let's say, four friends, um, you're, you're all probably going to know whose voice is whose. And it's going to set up the system where if someone says like, hey, I'm being shot at, you can look, you can scan the map, see their clan tag. And because of that voice, that Spartan chatter, uh, you know exactly where to go. Another thing I love is they have an indicator now above your teammates that shows you when they're being fired at. So, you know, my biggest complaint with a lot of first person shooters when it comes to like working as a squad and working as a team is it's hard to distinguish and tell someone where you are and what's happening. You're getting shot at. You're like, I'm being shot over here. And your your buddy's like, where's here? I, I don't know where you are. And so I think Halo Infinite is doing an amazing job of setting up a lot of tools that let you know, like instinctively, your friend doesn't have to tell you like, hey, I'm on the, the far west side of the map in this hallway. They're, you're going to be able to just scan this map and know exactly where they, they are. And I think that's going to kind of streamline a lot of the, the, the unnecessary communication that some shooters require. Yeah. And like, you know, I think the this is, you know, this is where the start and chatter system works really well. I think too is on top of that, your you know, your friend's guy will also say, like, taking fire from this part of the map and like you're like, Oh, okay, so I know where he is. Like that's it's very uh it cuts out, like you said, a lot of that middleman communication that can get really confusing in shooters and I think it streamlines that experience and it makes it easier to coordinate, which is I think a good thing. Because Halo often, for me anyway, feels like kind of just chaotic free-for-all, even in team modes. And I think that's kind of a bummer, because when you're working with your friends uh, and you're actually pulling off strategies, um, it's a blast. Like, I remember mm -hmm. a couple months ago, my friend and I were playing Halo 3 Big Team Battle on MCC. And there was I we were in a Hornet. He was he was I was flying it. He was riding on the side, and there was a Scorpion right below us. And it was like, okay, I'm gonna like jump off and hijack the tank. And it was like such a cool moment. Uh, and I, I think it'd be fun to be able to set up fun cooperative plays like that more. Uh, and it's it's kind of what makes me excited to see how big team battle plays because that's always been my jam. I've always been just I just love the way that Halo's uh, vehicles and weapons and equipment and movement always just like come together in this big you know crazy game mode so i'm looking forward to seeing how a lot of what we're talking about in the arena mode translates to a big team battle in the future which i'm assuming they're probably going to flight oh because, yeah. yeah so yeah i'm in the exact same camp like for me the most exciting thing about what i've experienced of halo infinite's multiplayer so far is i'm loving it i'm loving everything i've I'm playing, I love the way it feels, I love the mobility, and we haven't even seen the vehicles yet, which for me is, that has always been my favorite aspect of, of Halo, and I think even comparing it to like a battlefield, like it's hard to capture the feeling of Halo vehicles in any other game, and I think for a lot of people, like myself, that is one of the most special things about Halo is is the big team battles, is is the moments where you have the Banshee, you have the tank, you have all of these big vehicles coming together and having those epic moments. And yeah, I, I really hope they flight big team battles and soon because ooh, I want to feel it. I want to see, I want to grapple Jack. I want to see how the new mobility stuff ties into some of these vehicles. I want to skewer a Warthog. I want to skewer a Banshee. I, I want to see how, how nasty that skewer is against vehicles. Um, I know. Because it's designed to be, you know, an anti-vehicle weapon, as we saw in the trailers. It, it can do some damage. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things I'm most interested to see is in in the first multiplayer trailer they released, they showed uh, they showed a player using the deflector thing equipment to deflect the plasma pistol, uh, plasma pistol bolt back at the guy who shot it and basically reverse noob comboed him. <laughs> and that made me excited because I was like, oh man, can I deflect, like what, like what can I and can't I deflect this? Can I deflect like a scorpion shot? Can I deflect a tank bullet back at the tank? 
uh, you know, because in Halo 4, that was something you could do with the hard light shield. Uh, and that was, like, really fun. So I'm curious if they're kind of looking to bring that back a little bit. Or maybe I can reflect the, uh, I can reflect a sniper bullet back at the guy who shot it, like, uh, Genji, Overwatch. Yeah. Just, like, thing, like <laughs> it, it'll be really fun to see how these equipment things play around with vehicles, too, I think. Because, like you said, grapple jacking looks cool. Uh, I want to, you know, then they show in the trailer grapple jacking the wasp, and it's like, oh, that looks so fun. Dude, yes. Um, Like you talked about earlier, the, one of the best things about Halo is the sandbox feel. Like having this this area where you get to just run wild with all these fun tools and gadgets and and have fun. And I think, you know, they're, they've set a great foundation with even just the small slice that we've seen so far. So I cannot wait to see the bigger maps, and I can't wait to get my hands on those vehicles because uh, it's it feels really nice to play this slice and be able to say that this is like this is one of the best feeling halo games and that's that's saying a lot because halo has yeah. always felt really good and seeing like i talked about earlier people who historically have been kind of indifferent on halo playing this and being like okay halo multiplayer is is awesome Halo multiplayer feels great. Having people talk about how they played Halo multiplayer for three straight hours who didn't like Halo, who have come out publicly and said that Halo is not something they care about. Like that is a powerful statement about the, the appeal of Halo Infinite this, this holiday. Exactly. And I think what's even, you know, what's also very exciting is uh, this isn't even like a finished build at all. This is like a two month old, you know, version of the game that has since been, iterated upon more mm -hmm. and i know that at launch you know they're gonna have a lot more things tweaked like i know people have been saying the sniper rifle doesn't feel as good as it probably should or like you know certain things could be tweaked and like at launch just it's just the fact that right now people are saying like wow this game feels awesome like that makes me excited for what it's gonna look like as a finished polished product oh oh dude i'm ready um <laughs> gotta get to a quick super chat from brian hopkins the legend Amazing supporter of the show coming in saying, hey, Miles, just stopping in to show some support. Infinite sounds awesome. Can't wait to get into a flight. Later, dudes. Got to take the kids to a birthday party. Appreciate you stopping in. Huge ups for stopping in and dropping the super chat. Um, yeah, Halo Infinite. I've seen a lot of people on my timeline bum that they didn't get into the first flight. And I, I get it. There was that FOMO. There was a period in time where I thought I wasn't getting in. I saw all the emails coming through of people like, I got in, and I'm like, oh no, I haven't got mine. Am I, is it over for me? Am I done? Do I, am I not getting in? <laughs> and then obviously I, I, I got my flight invite, but I do feel for the people who didn't get in because um, most of my core friend group, most of my, like my four man squad that I play with consistently, I'm the only one out of four of us who got into the flight. So they're just watching me from the sidelines play Halo. And um, I know the feeling, I've been there. So it does suck that not everyone got in, but it sounds like they're going to be doing more flights and they're probably going to be increasing the scale of each one as they get ready for the that launch, dude. I'm, I'm a little scared for that launch because like you, like you talked about, cross-play, PC, Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One. This is going to be a humongous multiplayer launch, dude. And I'm kind of scared to see what those servers are like on day one. Absolutely, but I think I think that is why, you know, as three four three says, that is why we flight. Because yes. I think being able to rule out and fix and identify a lot of the bugs that are inevitably going to show up, show up because of that the size of that launch now and in the months leading up to launch is gonna hopefully result in a launch day that's a lot more stable, it's a lot cleaner fewer issues won't need you know a massive day one patch maybe like i think and that and that has worked for the mcc uh and then on pc in the last year or so like by and large the flighting process has made each you know each halo 2 halo 3 halo 4 odst like all these games that they brought to the pc mcc have been significantly better because of the flighting process that they've done with it and I think that, you know, that helps that helps people understand why it's important that Halo Infinite has these tests. It's not just for a fun time. It's important that 343 is able to identify and fix issues uh, so that they don't happen on the big day. 
Exactly. And that's why they've stressed repeatedly that this is this is not a beta. This is a, a technical preview. This is a flight to test certain mechanics, mostly on the e-commerce side. Like when you're buying stuff in the shop, when you're leveling up all this, the end game stats that come through and have to progress your character, they wanna make sure that that stuff is working when the game comes out. So that is the main focus of this particular one, but we also do get to have some fun and we do get to check out a couple maps. So j while we're having fun here, Brendan, give me the release date of Halo Infinite. If you're, if you're betting, if you're betting me $50 on the release date of Halo Infinite, what's it gonna be? Let me pull up my calendar. November 15th. Okay, November, November 15th, 15th, the anniversary. They're doing it, they're launching it on the anniversary. Yep, that's my that's my prediction. Uh if not then, then at least somewhere in November. But I'm going to go ahead and say November 15th because I know that like I'm pretty sure Phil Spencer was on a podcast recently and he was talking about how they were still finalizing the dates cuz they had to move some things around because of Forza and stuff, but I think Halo should take precedent precedence and it should be november 15th and everything else can move around that i see yeah I, when i saw the release date of forza horizon 5 i was like excuse me that's way too close to the release date for halo infinite what's what's going on here you're not going to give halo infinite it's it's grace period of a few weeks to just be be the showcase be the spotlight i do think the anniversary would be Perfect. Would be ideal. The best case scenario, release Halo Infinite on the 20th anniversary. Have this big blowout. Get people excited. Let's go. Let's bring back Mountain Dew Gamer Fuel. Get Chief back on the can. Um, and let's do it up big. Let's let's do it up like we did with, with Halo 3 back when that, that dropped. I am curious. I don't know that it will be the 15th. I want it to be the 15th. I think that week would be ideal. Maybe the Friday before, maybe the Friday after. Um, I think that's... I think with a game of this like scale, I imagine they want that Friday release. They might do like the early access ultimate mega edition or something to let you play a little bit earlier. Maybe that's the gimmick is it comes out that Friday officially, but if you're a game pass ultimate subscriber or whatever, you get to play it on the anniversary, bro. Think about that for a hot second. So let's say it comes out on the official release date. I will say will be the 19th. November 19th, 2021, I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll throw it out there if I'm wrong, whatever. I don't have any insider info to this. I will say November 19th, 2021 is the official release date, but they are going to incentivize an Ultimate Edition or Game Pass Ultimate, and they are going to let you play that bad boy on the anniversary. That's where I'm at. Well, I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> exactly. But either way, I'm... I mean, you know, I just hope mid-November. That's what I want. Yes, that's that's what we... Yes. The sooner the better, please. I'm ready for Halo. Um, I, I, I've i talked about this previously. I think, realistically, uh, games like Battlefield and Call of Duty were kind of the wild cards, and that's why Phil Spencer came out and said that, hey, you know, we have this five, six-week window that we're targeting, and I think they want to see when Call of Duty is going to come out because, again, like... Let's be real. Call, Call of Duty is a big deal. And especially when you even even when you're Halo, even when you're Halo, you got to think about when Call of Duty is coming out, because with this big relaunch, they want to make sure that it gets the time and space it needs to really kind of suck in the audience. And if you have a bunch of people who are diehard Call of Duty fans and it comes out the same week as Call of Duty, people are just going to play Call of Duty. But if you stagger it by a week or two, those hardcore Call of Duty fans maybe check out Halo and they go, oh, damn, Halo be feeling s Halo got me feeling some kind of way. And then maybe you suck in some of those Call of Duty fans into your your Halo Infinite multiplayer. So, yeah, I think realistically, Call of Duty more than Forza is going to be the, the biggest factor for when Halo Infinite releases. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I want to shout out a super chat from. Mr. Joanna Dark, he says, Hello to you two fine gentlemen with Halo Infinite multiplayer looking like a hit. How can 343 Industries keep the game fresh and growing? What modes of gameplay elements from other top games as a service or online shooters can they implement? So, Ooh. what do you think? Um, okay, so I, you know, I, I like what I've seen of the Battle Pass so far. I like the way that every single level, every time you level up within this pass, you get, there's a free tier and there's the paid tier. So, no matter what, like, because my biggest complaint with a lot of battle passes is, is you have this like five level gap when you're in the free tier or sometimes more where you don't get anything. 
if you level up five times and you play for hours and hours and hours and you don't get anything because you didn't pay into the you know premium tier so i'm glad that you know the, the battle pass system doesn't expire and that they give you something even if you're playing for free every single level um other live service stuff that they can implement i don't it's tough to say right now because i don't know what the, i don't know what the scope of the modes are going to be we have the arena and we have big team battle and is that is that it do you think they're going to launch the game with anything outside of big team battle and arena i think halo 5's one of halo 5's biggest issues was that it didn't have some core classic game modes at launch like not having infection there was really painful mm -hmm. um big team battle wasn't there either which was kind of a yikes but you know i think that was kind of halo 5's biggest problem and i i would hope that halo infinite solves that problem by not making that mistake twice yeah I but uh we'll ultimately have to see i do like the idea of creating new modes though for post-launch support i think there's a lot of fun modes from previous games that didn't return in halo 5 that i think would make a fun return in infinite like uh i don't know if any halo 4 fans remember dominion i thought that mode oh, was yeah. really interesting because you could like yeah you could like build turrets around your base and like capture bases and stuff it felt very battlefield um in, in a good way uh it, the, the sense of capturing points and like fortifying them up and uh, it was a very interesting take on Halo that I enjoyed. So if you know if, if they want to bring back modes like that that were really weird and kind of strange but were fun, I'd be down for that for post-launch stuff. Obviously, uh, they're going to keep making awesome armor sets and mm -hmm. coatings. And I think it's exciting to think about like the coding system in particular is not limited to armor. It's going to be on weapons. It's going to be on vehicles. Supposedly, there's going to be weapon charms. Um, there's going to be a lot of fun ways to express yourself as a player. And I think that's going to be their core drive for the future. Um, and I know we're talking multiplayer, but I also think we're going to see lots of uh, single-player expansions, too. Um, we saw them experiment with that with Halo Wars 2, actually. Uh, they had the there was a little single player mini campaign with ODSTs in that that was really fun, and then you had the Awakening the Nightmare DLC for Halo Wars Two, which was really cool because it was basically like bringing the flood back in Halo Wars, and you're playing as the Banished, and I, I like that's to this day one of my favorite Halo experiences ever, uh, outside of the shooter space is that expansion. So they've been toying around with like single player expansions in other games for a little bit now and especially like halo 4 and spartan ops too i think that kind of system in halo infinite would work really well because like the halo and i'm speaking as a lore nerd here so like the halo universe there's so many cool stories and characters that you know are very unlikely to make it to the main stage in the campaign but i think where that would have a lot of room to be flexed is in expansions like Let's say the Arbiter isn't in, isn't in Halo Infinite. Like, why not have an expansion about him? What's going on in the Arbiter, in the Arbiter's world right now? Yeah. Or, you know, maybe maybe Blue Team from Halo 5 isn't in Halo Infinite. Let's have a Blue Team expansion. Let's have a Fire Team Osiris expansion. What's going on with Spartan Locke? Like, I think that is a great format to get people excited about single-player content. Uh, because as we know, Halo Infinite is going to be a 10-year game, essentially. And I think having these things on both the single-player and multiplayer side of things is what's ultimately going to help the game thrive for years. Yeah, as we've seen with you know their, their statement of Halo Infinite being this platform, um, it's safe to assume that we'll see the, the, you know, the campaign experience expanded in some kind of way. Um, you know, on the Halo Waypoint website, there's, there was some you know, buzz around the phrasing of the different modes in the game and one of them was called campaigns plural so multiple campaigns implying that there will be a maybe a dedicated set campaign but like you mentioned there's opportunity to introduce new elements to this and they've also talked about how with the multiplayer experience they they want this to be a story as well so with with the spartan academy they are going to set that up as a way to introduce like why the the halo multiplayer 
exists. They don't want it to ju just be this arena that's completely isolated from the, the Halo universe. They are wrapping even the multiplayer component into the Halo world in an interesting way. So I'm curious to see kind of what that looks like as well. Um, I want to point out an interesting question here from Hargeet in the chat who says, will COD be that big this time? Do we think the current legal trouble they're in will be wrapped up in a couple of months? Um, I'm glad you brought that up. Towards the final topic of this show is going to be the, the Activision Blizzard situation. I'm going to talk about that and kind of, you know, what, what's going on there, how that's unfolding, and, you know, the impact of that. So we're, we're going to touch on that for sure towards the end here, and I'm glad you brought that up because that is, that is an interesting point. Um, and Paris says, sadly, that most people probably won't care and will still buy COD and COD will be huge. So definitely going to dive more into that towards, towards the end here. Um, the next topic I want to transition into that's been uh, controversial, if you will, on, on social media this week. I've had a lot of people tagging me. I've seen a lot of people discussing it very passionately, Brendan. And that is uh, PlayStation 5 has officially announced its storage expansion program and detailed how that will work and what's basically required of people who want to opt into this beta they're, they're, they're calling this basically the first batch of this a beta to kind of test the storage expansion. Um, so PlayStation came out with this detailed statement that said, all right, we're doing this. You can opt into the beta program. You have to find an M2 card that meets these speed requirements. And then you have to make sure that, you know, if your card doesn't have a heat sink, that you research the appropriate heat, heat sink for your SSD. So there's been a lot of kind of memes and jokes about this just being an awful upgrade solution for PlayStation 5 owners. So what I want to ask you is, is PlayStation asking too much of its fan base and its customers to expand the storage of the PlayStation 5? So my, it, I have two answers. On the side of, is it too difficult to do it? Absolutely not. I think that part has been overblown. Uh, significantly yeah, you, op you open the side you you open the side panel you unscrew it you unscrew the, the the cover you put the ssd in you screw it in you put the side panel back on it's fine it takes five minutes not a problem i think people are grossly uh you know being they're exaggerating that side of it i think where it is failing is i think sony's vagueness about it about what ssds work and which ones don't is the core issue for me. Uh, it, it's not a great system to just have a, a statement that says, we cannot promise that the SSD you buy will or will not work. And it's like, mm, like I'm not, I would be scared to purchase uh, an SSD for that as a consumer, right? Because you don't know, especially with SSDs, you know, you know, they're, they're, it's definitely, your average M.2 SSD is like $100, give or take a little bit, which is still... You know, it's it's more affordable than Xbox's proprietary solution, but it's still a pretty big chunk of change. Yeah, and not cheap. Going to buy one of those and not really knowing if it'll work or not, and having to like search through the internet and communities to figure that out is going to be a problem. I think. Um, obviously, people will help each other out, which is a good thing. Um, and you know, the community will probably stitch together a list of what SSDs do and don't work. But the, the yes. problem is that's something Sony should have done themselves. For yeah, me. yeah I, I, I totally agree. That's my biggest issue with all of this. The actual installation of an M2 is, is not that tricky. Like, like you mentioned, they, they obviously there's more steps involved in the Xbox one. And I've seen the meme of like back, you know, PlayStation's dunk on Xbox with the, with how to share games. I've seen that turned around with how to upgrade your uh, SSD on the Xbox series S versus X versus the PS5. And yes, the Xbox is way easier. Yes, it's proprietary. And yes, there are some, you know, issues and flaws we can point to with any sort of proprietary upgrade solution. Um, but the problem I really have with this is they are demanding a lot of, of their customers when it comes to researching which drives will work. And the fact that not only do they have to research which drives will work, um, like you mentioned, PlayStation is saying, there's no guarantee. You could buy this and it could meet all of our spec requirements and it could still not work. And we are not 
we're not covering you. We're not protecting you at all. So sorry, that's that's the situation. If if something's bricked, like that, that's on you essentially at this point. And to me, that is a weird message to send to your customers. Like, I get that if you want to allow, you know, people to have more options, which is good. You know, having more M2 options isn't a bad thing inherently. I do wish that PlayStation at least put their name to a handful saying, we have tested and guaranteed that these ones will work. You can, exactly. tr you can try other ones and these ones could work. They, they meet the spec requirements. We haven't tested those. This collection here, this collection right here, we have tested and we can guarantee that this will work. The fact that right now, again, this is still in beta, the fact that they don't have that, I think that's kind of, kind of baloney, but you know, again, it, it has been blown way out of proportion. People have been memeing on it and dunking on the design of the PS5. I do think the heat sink is the biggest fundamental flaw and the most absurd ask that you can, you're basically requiring people who, you know, ha probably, you know, play in the console space because they don't want to deal with the PC side of things, having to research which heat sink they need to get for this upgrade as well. So not only do you have to research, yeah. you know, the card that fits, but you have to research a heat sink. And if you don't, you're basically risking voiding your warranty because you didn't put a heat sink on this thing when they told you to. And I don't know, it's again, it is being blown out of proportion, but I do think, you know, PlayStation, we've seen a pattern of them asking way too much. Um, save transfers have been another big one upgrades for you know their their exclusives like playstation is asking so much from its audience and it's 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 counter to what xbox is doing and exactly. if I, I, i've seen people describe it as a minefield and i think that's the perfect way to describe it because you're right like you make one small step that's wrong and your warranty's gone and yeah. that just feels bad because it, it encourages people to just not even bother trying which is a bad thing because as games get bigger and bigger and bigger, it's more important than ever to have extra storage. Um, and I think another interesting thing, too, is, like, this isn't a huge deal, but I, I did see somebody point out the fact that, like, because the Xbox solution is just very plug-and-play, uh, it'll be a lot easier to take your games to someone else's house if you want to, uh, as opposed to having to open their PS5, uh, which is, you know, risky, uh, in the sense that you're opening somebody else's machine. Um, I think that's an interesting point that it, it's easier to take your games with you physically on an Xbox, uh, you know, whatever they're calling it, the storage card. Yeah. The storage so. expansion card is what it's officially labeled. <laughs> so yeah, again, we can have conversations as to, you know, is a pri proprietary solution bad, which was the conversation when Xbox announced that that was going to be the upgrade solution, this proprietary stick that only works with the Xbox series X and S. Uh, it's officially licensed, so it's it's guaranteed to work. They have said that other manufacturers will be able to make them as well, so that there will be more third-party options that are different sizes and different prices. Um, but yeah, it was it, it's it's been interesting to see all this play out because there were critics of Xbox's approach before the store yeah. when when the storage card was announced. Now there are critics of PlayStation's approach because they are you know they're not guaranteeing much of anything there which is which is weird because people yeah. have been waiting a long time to get details on how this m2 expansion would work we knew there was going to be an option to upgrade via m2 we've known that but we haven't known how it's going to work and the first taste of how this going is going to work for me personally has has left a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth when it comes to sony's commitment yeah. to its customers here yeah especially since like as a pc person uh you know, through and through. Uh, going into it, I actually figured I would have liked PlayStation's approach more. Um, because, I mean, and it's funny, because we've seen proprietary storage uh, completely destroy the, the Vita. That was that yeah. system's biggest issue, is that the storage for the Vita was just absurd. Um, so, you know, I was kind of worried that that was going to be a problem for Xbox. Uh, not to the same degree, obviously, but, like, it was going to be an issue. And it is kind of an issue. But, it, it, like, I almost wish that Xbox had the same situation that PS5 does, but just had done the execution of it better, right? Because the biggest issue with the PS5 problem, the solution right now, is not the concept of opening your console for a minute and installing an M tattoo. No. The issue is you have no clue what the M.2 or heatsink you can use is and the the publisher or you know they're not helping at all. 
um, and it, you, the, the internet is being forced to figure it out themselves. Uh, so in an ideal world, I think I would prefer the system Sony's using, but with better communication. Uh, but because they have given such poor communication, it makes Xboxes convenient, yet you know expensive, but still more convenient and guaranteed option, a lot safer and more uh, attractive. Yeah, and that's again, like you said, like the installation, which a lot of people have been memeing, is not that involved. Realistically, it is more involved than Xbox. And if Xbox, like you said, if both PlayStation and Xbox had the same approach, we probably wouldn't be seeing this kind of memed format. And a lot of it is, you know. Some of the Xbox fans just want to counter dunk on the, the PlayStation fans who ran with that. This is how you share games meme. They've been sitting on that, that, you know, dunk for a decade now, and they're just been waiting to throw it back in their face. And so they had their opportunity and I get it. It's fun, whatever. But the reality is the installation is not the problem. The installation is not that complicated. Um, but I, like you said, and like we've already said, I really don't like that PlayStation is putting all of the you know, demand in its customers. You can't go into a Walmart or a Target and say, this is a PlayStation 5 expansion M2 that will work for me. I can buy this off the shelf, take it home and install it. Like you can't do that. And I think that's going to kind of hurt the appeal for a lot of, you know, average people who don't want to deal with doing the research, figuring out what a heat sink even is. Um, I just, I, I don't think that that's, I think it's a really odd look for or a console, quote unquote. Yeah, for sure. I'm gonna get to a quick super chat from Jimmy Harrison, who says, man, I really enjoy your show. Getting ready to play some Halo myself. Thanks, brother. Uh, no, I really appreciate that, dude. Um, thanks so much for tuning in. Love what we're doing with the show. Love all the people who show up and listen to us rant every week. It, it means a ton. So um, thanks for tuning in. Play some Halo. Uh, hit me up on Twitter. Let me know what you think about it. Um, all right. Brendan, have you played The Ascent? Let me start with that quick question. I have not. I wish I had, though. But oh. I have just not been able to get around to it. Not enough hours in the day. It, it, yes, like I talked about earlier. I've, I, I've been able to squeeze in a couple hours of The Ascent. Like Going into launch, The Ascent was kind of one of my more anticipated games this year because of its cool kind of art style and the fact that it's a co-op RPG. But what I really want to talk about is... This obsession with Metacritic review. Oh, uh, wait. Okay, I think we might be back. I think we disconnected briefly. Um, so, sorry about that. Um, okay, so what I want to talk about today is this kind of weird obsession with Metacritic review scores. Because when the Ascent dropped, the conversations weren't really about, you know, is this game good? Is this game fun? This is what I like about the game. This is what I don't like about this game. I woke up to a bunch of notifications from people saying that um, this game only got a 64 on Metacritic. Um, this, this website gave The Ascent a 3 out of 10. And people were just fixated on this number from Metacritic. So, Brendan, what is your stance on metacritic as a whole i'll start by saying that i don't think that reviews and review scores are inherently bad and i don't think that metacritic is inherently bad but you have people basically demanding action against websites who give a game a bad score yep so it's tough because as somebody who reviews games pretty frequently it is frustrating to me that you know, the websites like Metacritic, it encourages people to not actually read any of the reviews written. So, like, nobody will read the reviews themselves. They'll just look at the score and use that to fit their narrative, essentially. And it's really frustrating because I think in a perfect world, I would just not have reviews have scores. But that's just not the world we live in. Yeah. Because I want think that the more, honestly, the more interesting. I think for me, what makes writing reviews so fun and reading them so you know engaging is getting a sense of who, how the reviewer feels about the game, the nuances of the the mechanics and the story and whatever else. And a score just won't communicate that. And I think just taking an average of the scores and putting it in somebody's face, yeah, it's convenient and it's quick. And I think there's some value in that in like a short term gauge of you know is this game worth checking out. But it is disappointing to see that so many people 
are sort of overlooking the the human element of reviewing video games. You know, when you when you just look at a score, you're just looking at a number. You're not looking at how somebody felt playing the game, right? Or how did this game make them feel? Like how were they excited? Were they frustrated? Were they, you know, annoyed? Like what are these emotions that you're going to feel playing the game? Like you don't get to connect with the the writer at all. And that's frustrating to me. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because yeah, like you and I, we both write reviews. So, you know, I I understand there is there is value in reviews. I, I read a lot of reviews when games come out because you know there's certain people that I trust in the space and I there's certain people that I I know, you know, kind of where they stand with a specific genre. So there there are people and you know outlets that I look to when a specific games game comes out because I know kind of generally where they fall in line with my my preferences there. I think ultimately the goal of a review score should be kind of reflecting what you write. So as someone who writes reviews, at the end of the day, you should be able to look at what you wrote, read it, and then have that reflect what your score is. I've had reviews where I went in thinking, oh, I'm going to give this a, let's say a nine, or let's say a, a, an eight. And then I wrote my review, got my, my several thousand words out about this game and read through it. And I'm like, okay, actually, you know what? This game doesn't actually deserve that score. I need to adjust my score because when I sit down and think about the reason that I like this game or I dislike this game, that's not reflected in what I'm writing here. So I'm going to adjust my score. So Metro UK is the one that's getting blasted right now because they had the the audacity to give the Ascent a three out of 10. And, and that's not fair because that tanked the, the review score of the Ascent. And now people think it's a bad game and blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, one review score is, just, it's, it's a small slice. And you can have your thoughts and opinions on that review. That's totally fine. I do ask if you are complaining about a three out of 10 review that you actually take the time to read it and see where this person was coming from with that score. And again, if you have criticisms of, you read this review, they gave it a three out of 10, their review doesn't read like it's a three out of a 10, three out of 10, then okay, you can talk about the, the semantics of, does this game deserve this score, whatever that case might be. But at the end of the day, um, that is just one person's opinion about this game. And they wrote it down. You don't have to take that as the gospel. You don't have to take that as a fact. Um, and I think, you know, there's this weird, unhealthy obsession with that. And we see a lot of people sharing these negative reviews. And so you're trying to defend the game by sharing a negative review, but all you're doing is amplifying this negative review of something. And you're doing the exact opposite by doing so. So ultimately, Game Pass democratizes review scores. You can play this game. You can install this game. You can play this game. If you don't like it, you just move on with your life. And that is the end of it. There's no financial burden for you. You don't really need to defend this game because people can play it and like it if they if they do and move on if they don't. So yeah, it's just, it's it's frustrating that every time a game comes out, if it's an exclusive, and this pretty much only is with exclusives, that there is this kind of fighting about the review score. Absolutely. And I think like, I think what sucks about it too is that when somebody writes a negative review of a game that you weren't expecting to see, I think so many people react to that with hostility. When I think the response should be to actually like check it out and see what points are being made. Because again, the journalist who's writing that review is a gamer like you. Right? So if they're having issues with the game, if they have a, a strong feelings about how the game frustrates them or annoys them or they have to deal with bugs and technical issues or whatever the problem is, you would think you would want to hear about that because you're going to be the one spending money on this game. And if you spend money on a game that's broken or has frustrating mechanics or, you know, maybe was misleading or whatever else, that would there would be value in that. But because people are so interested in on weaponizing review scores and uh, reacting negatively towards, you know, bad scores. Uh, I think a lot of, again, that human element of like connecting with the writer, getting, uh, you know, understanding how they feel about the game and understanding the value and, you know, maybe a warning for you uh, when you go to buy the game, what you're getting yourself into, that gets overlooked 
and people just say, you know, either, you know, the reviews paid off or some other crazy crackpot conspiracy theory. And I think, you know, there's the nuances of game reviewing in general, I think get lost with a system like Metacritic. Uh, and while it's not inherently bad, I think there are way too many people that are looking to weaponize that format. Yeah, because really what Metacritic is doing is it's completely eliminating all every shred of nuance that goes into a game review. Like every shred of individuality of the person's tastes, the reviewer, the outlet, their experience with gaming, all of that is completely eliminated and you have a number. You're reducing not only this entire game and all the work that this team put into this game and everything that they went into making this title, you're not only reducing that, but you're also reducing any articulation about the game to a single number. People screenshot that number and they say, this is good, this is bad. And it's, it's, it's frustrating because there is so much nuance that gets kind of eliminated when, when you do that. And it's frustrating and people put way too much stake into this three out of 10. Because I'll give, I'll give this advice to people who've been you know, throwing this review around and you know, using this to say that this is unfair, that this website sucks, whatever. If you read that review and you think that a three out of 10 is unjust, unfair, and they weren't able to articulate the reasons why they gave this a three out of 10, you don't, don't read that site. Um, and if more and more people are looking at that and they f are seeing more of these patterns where the people at this outlet aren't being genuine with their reviews and they're just being inflammatory, then less and less people are going to read it. But if they are purposely being inflammatory, which some people are suggesting, and you are sharing that review, then you are feeding into their basically strategy, if you will. And they're not going to stop just being inflammatory because they are going to get the, the metrics, which are the views and they are the engagement. So I'll just say that if, if you're really upset about this and you think the review is legitimately unfair and inflammatory, then you're, it's in your best interest to not share it. For sure. But again, you know, that's the problem, right? Is that Metacritic, like the, the encouragement to just look at a score that gets hidden away because pe all people see is a score. People, you know, aren't really encouraged to read through and actually see what they're saying and maybe identify that that review is kind of, you know, BS. Um, and, you know, that's just the issue. Yeah. And, you know, it, it is what it is, but it's something that I just wanted to talk about because, yeah, with the Ascent and this one particular review, I saw so much attention being put into this one particular review and not really into what's good about the game and what's bad about the game. And it was just really frustrating because I expected to love the Ascent. Like I was expecting to go into the Ascent and absolutely have a blast. I've been playing it and it's it's good. It's fine. Um, it has some of the best kind of physics and particle effects that I've seen. Like playing this on Series X, it, it really feels like a next-gen game and it really looks like a next-gen game. The game looks incredible, sounds incredible, and all of the physics and stuff in this game are, are, are really impressive. But that being said, the, the core kind of experience and gameplay loop wasn't necessarily what I wanted. So I'm finding myself not that interested to kind of keep pushing forward with this. So to me, it's, it's not a bad game, but it's, you know, I was, again, I was expecting to love it more than I did. Um, so again, people are saying that, you know, 70 is unfair or that because this is an Xbox exclusive that it's getting a lower score and um, stuff like that is, I don't know, it's just, it's very diminutive of everything that goes into this entire process, I feel like. Oh, for sure. Like, you know, again, as somebody who reviews games all the time and you do too, like, that's not how it works. It just isn't like we spend hours and hours and hours playing through these games and investigating their systems and thinking about how other players will perceive them and noting down what frustrates us about the game, what we really, what really, what we like about the game so much. How does the game, you know, feel to play all these things that we take notes on and think about and like wrestle with ourselves with. There have been times where I've had to, you know, sit down for like an hour and really think to myself, like, how do I want to score this game? Or how do I want to like convey my thoughts here? Because I have conflicting thoughts on this and it's such a complicated experience and it just can't be broken down into a score. Uh, and that's, I think, every review I've ever written, I wish that I didn't have to put a score on it. Uh, and that's really frustrating because I know that, you know, the way the system works, 
you know, there has to be a score on things, or else it's we it's weird and it stands out, and people aren't able to just look at a score and get your general opinion. But I almost wish that we could live in a world where game reviews didn't have to have scores, because that would encourage people to really dig into the nuances of our thoughts. In this game review utopia, yeah, there would be... Again, it's tough because people want the convenience of the review score, and I get why why they exist. But as we've demonstrated, as as folks who, you know, write reviews, it's... it. Uh, it it destroys so much of the nuance of a review and it's tough. One person's seven out of 10 means something completely different than another person's seven out of 10. So I don't know. I just wanted to touch on that because there's been so much negative energy focused around it. And I just want people to, you know, think about how amplifying that negative energy affects this overall. Yeah. And I'm sure I hope it's interesting for everybody out there to get like a reviewer's opinion on this and get our side of the story a little bit because as miles was saying somebody else's seven out of ten might not be the same as your seven out of ten but the reason why the score is seven out of ten might be different for different people and so again that's kind of the, the the issue of the game score just generalizing thoughts down into a number yeah and uh, yeah it's it's you know if you just wanted like casually go online if you're someone walking into a store and you're like it's like when you go to amazon like when you're shopping on Amazon, you're like, should I buy this? You just look at the stars. Like you might read a, a, a quick little blurb or two, but realistically, you're just looking at the, okay, this has got a four and a half out of five review stars. Like there's 2000 reviews, four and a half out of five. Okay, cool. This is probably good. And that's kind of, I think, you know, what, what the value is of Metacritic for certain people. And again, that's not inherently bad. Um, I, but, you know, I think people put too much stake into it when it comes to saying that a game is inherently good or bad because, you know, it's everyone's tastes are a little bit different. All right. Exactly. Brendan, I want to transition into our final topic of the show today, which is one that has been it's it's definitely one of the heavier topics. And I just want to let everyone know, you know, I know not everyone wants to hear about, you know, the the political thing and, and the, the, the social political elements that go into making a game. And I, I put this at the show. At, I wanted to have this in the show because I want to talk about it. And that is what's going on with Activision, Blizzard, and King and the lawsuit that was filed against the company by the state of California for basically blatant and gross sexual harassment and misconduct at the workplace. Um, I won't go into too much of the specifics of you know w- what has been happening, but there are some horrifying examples online that you can read of women and employees of Blizzard Activision who've been, you know, forced to endure just disgusting, horrific things that no person in general should have to experience. But more importantly, no one should ever, ever under any circumstances have to endure at at a place of work. If you go to work, you should feel safe and you shouldn't have to worry about predatory behavior from your superiors. And um, the state of California has been doing a investigation for the last several years into complaints that have been filed by current and previous employees of Activision Blizzard. And we had a we had one of our own, you know, our, our gaming lead for Windows Central, Carly Veloci. She went down to Activision Blizzard during the walkout and she spoke to members of the team and got some insights into their kind of their fears, their hopes about this process. And if you haven't checked it out, go, go to Windows Central, track down that article because it's an incredible read about the, the, the human element of game design and the human component of, of working and having to endure um, something like this. So Brendan, I'm sure you're, you're up to speed. We've been talking about this a lot in our, in our work Slack and group Slack, but do you have any comments on, on this current situation with Activision Blizzard? I mean, all there really is to say is to to believe survivors and, you know, listen to what they say. And, you know, it's, I mean, there's nothing else to say, really. It's just awful, and it needs to be addressed. And we need to do our part and support the people who come forward. Yeah, it's so... The, the the employees of Activision Blizzard have basically given given the, the management a list of demands as part of this walkout, saying these are the things that you have to address. 
for us to be happy here. Um, what I want to know and what I want to pose a question to everyone watching here is as a consumer, because we had, you know, some folks ask these questions earlier, is this going to impact the sale of, of Call of Duty this year? Is this going to affect the sale of a, a Diablo 2? As a consumer, does this make you less likely to support future Activision Blizzard projects? Let's say they don't change anything. Let's say this walkout happens and nothing is addressed whatsoever. Are you someone who's going to just quite frankly ignore that and, and buy Diablo 2 and buy the next Call of Duty? Um, and then as a, as a you know, supporter of, of the employees here, what, what is our best course of action? Um, should we just completely boycott any of their products and services moving forward? Because one thing I want to point out about all of this that has kind of added more fuel to the fire and made me personally more upset about this entire situation is the fact that, you know, because of these walkouts, it's been revealed that they basically hired a, a union busting, busting firm. So your company gets charged of gross sexual misconduct, sexual harassment that has led to, you know, reported cases of employee suicides. And you are hiring a union busting firm to make sure that a union doesn't get formed during these walkouts because of your business practices. Um, that for me is it kind of shows where where Activision Blizzard's corporate leadership is at. They are obviously clearly and blatantly invested in in, in the bottom line. And they want to pub public facing address that and say, oh yeah, we're concerned about our employees. We want to make sure that everything's okay. But the fact that they are spending financial resources to ensure that a union doesn't get formed because of this shows that fundamentally and financially they they don't care about their employees. No, they're doubling down completely. And it's important that we don't let them get away with that. Um, to answer your question, for me personally, the answer is effective immediately. I'm not supporting anything Activision and Blizzard makes at all. I, I'm and I'm not going to want to write about it either. Like I don't want to write about it. I don't want to play anything. It's until any of that gets addressed and fixed or worked towards. Or uh, I have zero interest in anything that they put out because really, to me, buying those games feels that. Uh, that grinder, that meat grinder of a culture they have going. Um, and I think that's the approach that most people should take. And I think the biggest hurdle to progress is probably going to be the fact that right now, this situation has not gone very far beyond the usual gaming circles. And I think at this point, it's important that larger media uh, addresses the issue and makes people aware of the problem. Because I think a lot of average gamers have no idea this is happening. Not everybody is super involved on Twitter or gaming social media, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's really important that larger media sources uh, begin to address the issue. And a huge part of the way we can get them to do that is that, you know, the smaller gaming focused sites like ours, compared to, you know, obviously like big news stations, uh, if enough of us, you know, highlight the issue and talk about it and bring attention to it, it will get noticed and covered because it's a big story. So I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a problem that we can solve together. Yeah. And I appreciate everyone who's, you know, tuning in and listening to this and having this conversation with us, because, you know, for me personally, I was incredibly proud to see, you know, Carly from our team go down there and amplify the voices of the people who, who need to be heard because, you know, Activision Blizzard is a humongous company, but as you pointed out, not everyone is super invested in the, the, the gaming discourse and these gaming circles. So they don't even really hear about these, or if they do, there's, they hear, they see a headline that says like, you know, Activision Blizzard and a sexual harassment lawsuit. And that's kind of the extent of what they hear, but they don't hear some of the, the horrific stories that, you know, these people are forced to endure and you, it's, it's really tough to support a company when you know the head of this company, Bobby Kotick, is getting $180 million a year, uh, has been embroiled with his own sexual harassment lawsuits uh, issues in the past, seeing him make this absorbent amount of money on the backs of people who are being exploited and having to suffer through, you know, these disgusting situations, like, 
yeah, as a customer, like I, I'll use Diablo 2 as an example. Before all of this, I had every intention of, of playing Diablo 2. Diablo 2 is one of my favorite games of all time. I was going to buy the resurrected version. I was going to play it. I was incredibly excited about it. I can't, in good conscience, buy that game. I can't look at what's going on, look at how they've been responding to this, and say, I'm going to buy this game. I'm going to give Bobby Kotick money because... We, we know how it breaks down. The, the employees there are getting a fraction of what the executives are getting there. And the executives are the one who are, ones who are allowing all of this kind of misconduct to exist. And they're the ones shelled by this corporation. And we have individuals hiding behind the Activision Blizzard name. And there's no sort of accountability being applied to individuals who are being absolutely disgusting, vile people who are... Per permanently damaging some people's lives in some cases. And it, it, it's hard for me to just look at that and read about that and hear people's voices and say, yeah, you know, I, I get that, but also I want to play Call of Duty. Like, it's, for me, that's, that's impossible. At this point, it's impossible. Exactly. And it's like, you know, this is the kind of issue that you would normally hope that HR and executives could solve. But considering the fact that the people in HR and the people in executive positions are the problem. Our really only option left is to hit them where it hurts, which is their wallets. I think, anyway. Yeah, and we th they have demonstrated that they are more concerned about profits and revenue than anything else. Yeah, and and some people will say, well, if you don't buy the game, than the developers that we're trying to help suffer. And that's in I'm sure that's true in some ways, but at the end of the day, my opinion is, you know, this isn't going to stop until the meat grinder that's fueled by our cash stops. So it sucks. It's not a fun way to it's not a fun solution at all. It's messed up. But I don't see any other way that you can really make a difference yeah. beyond getting the word out. You know what I mean? And it's what, yeah, like uh, on the show, I always talk about, you know, like conversations about gaming um, and development and everything that goes into making games should be fun. So if there's ever any, any element of that puzzle that you look at and that is being restricted in a fundamental way, like it's hard for me to have a, have fun with a game when I hear that someone had to go through just horrendous hellish conditions to, let me play this game. Like it's, it's, it's really, and again, I know not everyone is that invested and some people can kind of ignore that sort of things, but I don't think we should because uh, we've seen more people, Ubisoft, um, a lot of people from Ubisoft have signed an open letter saying that we support Activision Blizzard. Our company is also doing a bunch of terrible things. And so we, we know it's not just Activision Blizzard. We know that's the reality. It's not just Activision Blizzard. They're in the, the spotlight right now because California has been doing an investigation and we've seen all of the specific examples of horrifying behavior from that company, but Ubisoft, another company, there's been a bunch. So, you know, hopefully by amplifying the voices of, the, of, of these employees, of the people who've had to suffer through these conditions, we can, we can start working towards some change for them because not talking about it is not the, not the ideal way to address the situation. If we ignore it and we just buy a call of duty, um, they will just wait a couple months, let everything blow blow over, reveal the new Call of Duty, and then life will move forward as as they want. Um, and I think it's important for us to respect the inv individuals who are sharing their stories because let's be real, nobody wants to share a story like that. Like some of these stories that have been shared, nobody wants to talk about that. That's not something that you just casually throw around as, as, a, as a fun conversation. Um, nobody wants to talk about that, but they are doing it because they they want people to understand what is happening behind the scenes. Absolutely. So and like uh, beast mode 10 in the chat made a good point. He says the devs are already suffering. They fired 300 employees in the same year that uh, Bobby Kotick got a pay raise. Exactly. That's the point I'm making. The, the meat grinder is already grinding the employees. Us not buying the games they make. Yes, it will hurt the developers in the short term, but at the end of the day, that's how we, that's how we influence what's going on as a consumer. That's the thing that we can do that hits the executives where it matters for them, which is their wallets. Yeah. And you if have, we... sorry, go, sorry, go ahead. Nope, go ahead. 
I'm going to say we have figures like, you know, Phil Spencer and a bunch of big figures in the industry speaking up about this as well. And it's cool to see that there's some kind of solidarity and support from these because you could look at Microsoft and say, oh, they're just another big evil corporation. They probably have stuff similar behind the scenes. But, um, you know, it, Microsoft and other big companies are proving that that doesn't have to be the case. Your workplace practices don't have to be absolutely applicable to still be humongous. Microsoft is humongous and they make absurd, um, absurd amounts of money. Um, but they are still, a lot of their biggest folks are speaking out and they have teams dedicated to making sure that things like this don't exist in their workplace. And Activision Blizzard really needs to do a, a, a clean sweep of a lot of their executive leadership at this point, in my opinion. Oh yes, absolutely. We can't just keep allowing, you know, individuals to hide behind the shield of the corporation and say that, okay, yeah, we understand we hear we're taking actions to make sure that this changes. And then those same people are still involved on the highest levels of leadership. That's to me, that's not how you make a change. It absolutely isn't. Um, and that's been proven by cases of things like this happening before and, you know, nothing ultimately changing over the years. Yeah, so not the most uh, ex uplifting topic to kind of close the show with, but I I had to talk about it. We we had to talk about this. We had to discuss the situation. And more importantly, we have to kind of amplify the voices of the people who are, are suffering through this right now because vid making a video game should not damage someone forever. People should not be li literally killing themselves to make a video game. And... Hearing stuff like that just breaks my heart. And it's so distressing to hear. And I'm, I'm, you know, frustrated that this is, that, you know, this is happening, but I'm also grateful that this is coming to light and people are amplifying these, you know, conversations because it has to happen. There has to be change. This cannot, the status quo cannot be maintained. Like it does not have to be this way. And I really genuinely, sincerely hope there's some legitimate change industry wide after all of this kind of has exploded. For sure. I'm with you on all points. All right. Well, everyone, uh, before we wrap this up, Brendan, where can people find you? If they want to send you some takes, actually, more importantly, if they want to question you about your extensive knowledge of Halo lore, uh, where can they get a hold of you? Uh, you can reach me on Twitter, uh, at Brendan Lore Lowry. It's on the screen. If you want to go follow me there. You can also head to Windows Central and look for my author page. Uh, look for my stuff. I write a lot about Halo, Destiny, uh, any other game I'm into. Going to be uh, planning on doing Stalker 2 when that comes out next year. Uh, you know, covering anything that really interests me in gaming. And stuff that we need to uh, keep track of. So if you like, if you want to read my stuff, you can find me there too. Uh, that's pretty much it, I would say. I'm not all over the the Instagrams and whatnot, but and, I and, have and my... The, what, what you kids are doing to Instagram and whatnot? <laughs> uh, no, appreciate you joining me, man. Uh, it was great to have you here to talk about Halo. I, like I talked about, you're the, the Windows Central resident Halo expert, um, and I'm glad we're, we're both kind of on the same page with, with how good Halo Infinite's feeling. To everyone who tuned into the show today, appreciate you hanging out. Appreciate you humoring our rants. And until next time, I will catch you next Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Take care, everybody. Have a good one, guys.